Good morning, guys. How's it going? Actually, good afternoon. Sorry, I just saw the time. Um, thank you for joining me for morning prayer this morning. I hope that morning prayer, even though for a couple of days, well, almost a week now, that's just about all I've been putting up, um, that, that, that the morning prayer is blessing you guys. It's so important to start the day with God. Start the day giving glory, and your day is set up for success every time. And you just can't beat it when you acknowledge God and acknowledge Him in everything that you do. <clears throat> I want to do that today also in the revelations that are being given about scriptures. Um, right now we have a huge debate on the rapture. A lot of vitriol being cast around. A lot of accusations being cast around. What I'm trying to do, I, I did that at the beginning and then I realized what was going on. and realized it was Satan trying to put Christians against each other. I am not going to do that anymore. What I'm going to do is show scripture that shows we're dealing with two different events when we read the scriptures in the Bible. Now, uh, this is going to tie directly or indirectly to a video that Diamond Justification is about to do about Matthew 24. There's a lot of stuff in Matthew 24 that links to Joel, uh, Corinthians, links to all kinds of other scriptures. He's got a great study he's going to do on that. I'm not going to expound on what he's going to do. That's for his video. But what I want to show you guys is I'm going to show you the scriptures that show that there are two different groups of people being dealt with in the beginning at the beginning of the tribulation one group of people is the rapture and another group of people are the ones that are coming to faith and washing their robes white in the tribulation a lot of people think revelation 7 is about the rapture church and it is not at all not it's a totally different group of people coming out of tribulation whereas revelation chapter 5 which also relates back to Daniel chapter 7, which I did a video on that already. This is the raptured church. This is a completely specific group of people, but I'm going to show you a detail that a lot of people miss, and I don't think anybody has covered yet. Um, I mentioned it loosely in that one first video I did comparing Daniel 7 and chapter 5 of Revelations, but now I'm going to break it down for you. Uh, versus other scripture because there's stuff in Matthew 22 which I'm about to read and there's stuff in Revelation 19 that links this together and explains this so please travel along with me whether you agree or disagree and look at these scriptures because this could give you a great avenue to either witness to somebody or help your understanding in what's going on because honestly whether we see pre-trib post-trib bid-trib no-trib doesn't matter as long as we love God, we're all in the same boat. Plain and simple. The only thing we must agree on is grace through faith. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. We can disagree on everything else. We can disagree on tithing. We can disagree on the law. We can disagree on the command. We can disagree on everything else. Because the Bible says of itself, it is subject to interpretation. Let each man propose in his heart what is acceptable to give. Let each man be fully convinced some men regard one day better than another. Some men regard all day the same. Both are right. It's in the scriptures. I've done videos on this. So let's start with Matthew 22. I don't want to waste any time here. So this is the parable of the wedding feast. But there's two key verses in here that are very important to what we're going to discuss. So let's set the stage of what we're talking about. And this is obviously talking about the rapture church. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables, saying, and listen, when you understand parables and what they're referring to, it makes all the difference in the world. Like I used to think the parable of the wise virgins and foolish virgins was about the rapture church, and then I learned it absolutely is not. It is dealing with the people that are coming out of the, out of the tribulation. The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. Well, this is God and Jesus, obviously. And sent out his servants. Oh, and before I go any further... Any of you guys that suddenly get this spur in your side to say, you're going off the of doctrines of men, you need to read the scriptures, but you need to watch the whole video. Because I'm obviously reading the scriptures and I'm not sharing you anything that anybody else has given you. This is my revelation, nobody else's. I haven't heard anybody say this yet. So, watch the whole video before you decide to cast a bunch of hate and shade. And maybe you might learn a little something and you can go do your own study and see for yourself. And sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. So, people were called, didn't want to answer. Remember the phrase, many are called and few are chosen? It comes up here in a minute. So they were called, didn't, didn't want to come. Okay. Again, he sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. 
He's talking about the Jews. That's where Jesus was sent first, was to the Jew. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. Go back and look at what happened. What they did to the Christians. What they did to Jesus. This is talking about that very instance, that very event. But when the king heard about it, he was furious and he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. 70 AD, Jerusalem was razed to the ground, so was the temple. It stayed empty for 2,000 years. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways and as many as you find invite to the wedding. These are the Gentiles. The Gentiles showed that they wanted it. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. Notice what he said, both bad and good. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. He didn't have faith. That's how you get the wedding garment is your faith in Christ. So he said to him, friend, how did you come here in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. He tried to circumvent Christ to get into the get into heaven. And we know that you cannot go around Christ. Christ is the narrow path. Christ is the narrow gate. You must go through him to get there. If you don't, here's what happens to you. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is a warning given in this parable to those who deny the faith. You can say you're a Christian all you want to. But if you're not showing the evidence of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, you are not saved. Simple. Now, I can't look at somebody and go, hey, you're not saved. That's not my right. It's not my call. That's God's call. I cannot tell that person they're not saved. However, <clears throat> using right judgment, I can tell that person, you know what? You, you, don't, you don't quite got this correct, and you're not putting your faith and trust in Christ. You're putting it in your ability to, to be good and to do good and fulfill the commandments in the law. That's incorrect. Here's the scriptures that pertain to that. That I can do. If I see somebody teaching a false doctrine, a false teaching, a lot of people are coming against Watch Woman 65 right now because of this. Because that's her ministry right now. My ministry was that way too. And sometimes I still do it. But they're not paying attention. They're, they're offended because somebody is talking bad about them. It's the feel-good movement. Oh, we have to tolerate everybody. No, we do not. There are guidelines about salvation, and you have to adhere to those. If you don't, just like this parable shows, that guy was there, and it's like, wait a minute, you're not, you're not supposed to be here. You have to meet certain criteria, grace through faith. For many are called, but few are chosen. So you see right here, here's that phrase I was telling you. Many people are called, but very few are chosen. Now, a lot of people say, well, that's because he's going to call a bunch of people, and if you're good enough, you'll get chosen. No, that's not what that's saying. Many are called. Everyone. Salvation is for everyone. Christ died once for all sin. Everybody is called. Few are chosen. These are the ones who decided to choose Christ. These are the ones that, okay, you're coming here. You're going to be a part of this. That's what that's talking about. The one thing you have to do as a Christian is come full circle in your understanding that it is grace through faith. You cannot save yourself. There is nothing you can do, you can say, no way you can walk. Nothing that you can do. Fulfilling the Ten Commandments, the law, giving, nothing that will get you into heaven, that will get you salvation. You must have faith in Christ and put your trust in Him for your salvation and your redemption. Period. There is nothing else to add to that because that's what the scripture says. He who believes, he who has faith, he who trusts shall have everlasting life. These are the words of God and Jesus Christ. So them being the authority, that's what has to happen. Now everything else that happens in a Christian's life is a result of that salvation. It's If you pattern your life by the Ten Commandments, it'll be a natural pattern. It won't be you forcing it. Because I hear them all the time. Oh, you got to be sinless. Tell me how you're sinless. Well, I don't act on my thoughts. But Jesus said your thoughts were sin. So again, tell me how you're sinless. If you can't do it, you have to put your full faith and trust in Christ to do it for you, which he already did. If you are trying to do it, why did Christ die for you? If there was a way you could be good enough to get into heaven, 
and keep salvation, why did Christ have to die? Because you could have just done it yourself. See? You have to think about these things. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, for many are called and few are chosen. Now the Pharisees said, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? And of course they were trying to trick him. They were going on about him. And let me get down here. As you all already know this one, you can go read it. Okay, so now he's talking about the, uh, they marveled at him with their way. The same Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to him and asked him, Teacher, saying, Teacher, Moses said that if a man died having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there um, were with us seven brothers. The first died after he had married and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third, even to the seventh. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had her. Listen to what Jesus says, because this ties to what I'm about to tell you. Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage. So all you people that think there's sex in heaven, you're wrong. You think there's an actual marriage ceremony that's going to happen? You're wrong. It's the joining of the head, Christ, to the body, church. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. I'm going to say that again. But are like angels of God in heaven. Now, let's take a run to Revelation chapter 5. So, then I saw on the right hand of him, this is where the Lamb is taking the scroll. This is the throne room. Now, you can actually start in chapter 3 and read up to chapter 5 and get the setup of what's happening. And it actually starts to create a, a time frame. A lot of this stuff reads like it's happening within a few days or weeks of it. It actually could be years. Anyway. And I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back sealed with seven seals. We know this is the beginning of the tribulation. The first seal releases the Antichrist. That's why we can't find him now. We've spent a lot of energy looking for him, but we're never going to see him. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the seal or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though he had been slain. Remember I told you? Everybody thinks Jesus is real pretty. He's scarred up. His, his scars are his glory. And we're going to see him that way. Um, ha having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, listen closely, the four living elders and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. You remember, the twenty-four elders are a representation, they are the representing faction or, or leadership of the group. These twenty-four elders are the leaders of the group. You gotta go back and do your own study on the twenty-four elders. It goes way back in the Old Testament. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. What is going on here? Because that is not angels. Angels are already in heaven. They don't need salvation. But listen to what he's saying here. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. What are they talk who are they talking about? They're talking about the saints, the people of the last two thousand years. And have made us kings, priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Who is this describing? The church. This is the same description used to to talk about the church. They shall be kings and priests and rule with Christ forever. They are going to be redeemed by his blood. Us. Now listen, then I looked and I heard a voice, a voice of many angels around the throne. Then I looked and I heard the voice 
of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessings. And then they, the creatures were, were blessing him. What, what is going on here? Because he heard, I heard the voice of many angels. Was it actually angels? And we can go back to Daniel 7. Let's go back to Daniel 7. And look at what Daniel 7 says. Because they had, him and uh, John had the exact same vision. So I saw a vision in the night. Behold, the four winds, uh, great beasts. There's the different beasts, another beast. Okay, I watched till thrones were put in place. These are the 24 thrones. And the Ancient of Days, that's God, was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him a thousand thousands ministered to him Remember what we just read ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him the court was seated and the books were opened i watched them because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking i watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame as for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season in time. We know these is, is talking about the kingdoms. Now, I, wa I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, coming with the clouds of heaven. Where we hear that before? He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. So, now you see the Daniel's vision is being interpreted on here. So, what are we seeing here? Very specific description of a very specific people. Let's see... Okay, let's go back to Revelation, chapter 7. So, in Revelation chapter 7, so here's the number of those in, in verse 4, and here's the number of those who were sealed, 144,000, so we know that's a group that's going to be during the tribulation. These are from the tribes of the children of Israel. Now, verse 9, And these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number. If this is a group of people no one could number, why in chapter 5 did it give the number of the name, the number of that group of people as 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands? And when you look that up, what that means, 10,000 times 10,000 is 100 million. And thousands and thousands comes out to a few million, give or take. So, we have a specific number here. But in this passage... We have a wholly, totally different group of people. No one could number them. Of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes. Now listen, this isn't happening at the beginning when he took the scroll. He's already broken a bunch of seals. So we're looking at two completely different time frames. Revelation chapter 5. That group of people is watching him take the scroll and breaking the first seal. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, seals have already been broken. And they were all clothed with white, ro white robes with palm branches in their hands. That description isn't used in Revelation chapter 5. And crying with a loud voice saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. They're saying something different now. All the angels stood around the throne and the elders with the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God. Remember back in Matthew 22? And they will be like angels. They're not given in marriage, but they will be like angels. Then one of the elders answered, verse 13, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes? And where do they come from? And do you remember the description we had in Revelation chapter 5? 
listen to this. And I said to him, sir, you know. So he said to me, these are the ones who come out of great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. Elsewhere in the Bible, Jesus talks about making those people pillars of his throne. That, that conquer, that win, that overcome in the tribulation. That's a different group of people than the church. The church is a whole separate group. doesn't refer to them that way. He who sits on the throne will dwell among them, and they neither hunger any more nor thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of them will shepherd them, and lead them to living fountains of waters. And God will wipe away every tear from, it, from their eyes. So we can see pretty clear, and, and I'm not even giving you all the scriptures that pertain to this. It would require you know an hour and a half long video to cover everything. But you can see right off the bat that these are two completely different groups of people. Now... Check this out. I think it's verse 8. So here's the 24 elders in verse 4 again. So here we read verse 6, and I heard it as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, that's many tongues, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice, and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. How is she making herself ready? She's in heaven. She's going through the Bema seat, being judged. Those that are coming out of the tribulation are standing there in the throne room, waiting for this to unfold. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. Not everybody is going to be there. And I fell at his feet, listen closely, to worship him. But he said to me, See that you do not do that. Listen close. Because angels don't have this. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. And this is supposed to be an angel that's walking with him, right? But it's not. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And I fell at his feet to worship him and he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant of your brethren. That means he's one of the people that was taken up as, as the bride. And this person is standing there escorting him around heaven. It's not an angel, it's someone else. The angels don't have the testimony of Christ. We do. Only those who have walked the earth have that testimony. Only those who are born of water, born of woman, and born of the Spirit. They have the Holy Spirit. Have the testimony of Christ. We have that here. They don't need it up there because they're already there. You see where I'm getting that here? They don't need salvation. They don't need the testimony of Christ. They're already in the presence of God. We do need it. That's why we have that. That's why what he's saying here is he's saying, I am one of you who have the testimony of Jesus. And it goes on talking about the different horses that are going to come out. So it's really important to look at all the descriptions. When you see a key word and they are like angels, you got to go look at the other scriptures that talk about that. Because in that process, you start to find things that lead you to, well, wait a minute, that's talking about this group. That's the church. Then you start finding other stuff. Wait, that's talking about the church too. Oh, wait, Revelation chapter 5. That's the same description used in 1 Thessalonians and Corinthians about the church. So who is that in Revelation chapter 5? The church. We are raptured before the tribulation. Now, I firmly believe through other scriptures, I haven't done a video based on this yet, from all of the scriptures that I've read, that when the rapture of the church happens, there's going to be a time frame, a, a time of probably destruction and upheaval, where it's going to be cataclysm, everything's going to go crazy, everything's going to fall apart, and then they're going to build it back up. This is when your when we go up and we stand before the Lord. This is when your Antichrist is going to come out, your new world order is going to come out, your new world religion is going to, all this stuff's going to happen. And it could be eight months to eight years, I don't know. 
but then the tribulation will start. Because we see a very clear description of Daniel's 70th week. Very specific events happening during this. Yet we don't see anything going on between the rapture and that time frame. And, as far as I can tell, it doesn't link the rapture to the very beginning of the tribulation. It kind of hints that there's a gap somewhere in there. Because a lot of people are saying, well, no, the rapture can't happen now. It has to happen further down the line because this is when I think the tribulation is going to be. Wrong. The rapture can ha the rapture could have happened 1,500 years ago. And it would take 1,500 years for us to get to when the tribulation was going to happen. The rapture needs nothing to, to instigate it. Because even back then, right after Jesus died and the church was getting set up, they thought the rapture was going to happen. Then, because they understood, having personal account and first-hand knowledge of this, they understood that it's not about any precursor event to this. This could happen at any moment. It is about what's going to happen, the, the kickoff of the tribulation. And we know that event. That event is the breaking of the first seal, the releasing of the Antichrist. We can't possibly know who the Antichrist is. We can see all the people that are playing their role. We can't possibly know who it is because that first seal has to be broken in order to show who he is. But when you read the chapters, it gives you the idea, it shows you that the church, the group of people that are the church, it gives the description of them, almost verbatim, are out off the earth and in the throne room standing before God. Then that seal is broken. And even then we got to go over a whole chapter to get to that chapter that talks about it. So that's a, a frame, a time frame. So go do your own study on this. I gave you enough to get you guys on the ball rolling. This is a great thing to get you deeper into the scriptures because more revelations will come from this and it'll lead you in all kinds of directions. It'll lead you up to Joel where you can read about the Valley of Armageddon, the battle and the, the army that's going to be marching down there and how nothing can stand against it. Um, on and on and on. And there's so much stuff that throughout the Bible that talks about that end time. There's more description about the seven-year tribulation than there is anything else in the Bible. Because that's the worst event that ever hit this earth. That's the most dramatic event to ever hit this earth. If there's so much information in the Bible about it, why are we in such a division about it? It should be no problem to go in there and find the stuff and read it. <clears throat> so anyway, this is my perspective. This is the revelation I was given. Please go look it up. Don't believe me. Don't believe anyone else. Go read the scriptures for yourself. One of the worst things we have right now is that people don't read the Bible enough. People don't get into scripture enough. They don't look and then let it lead them and then let it lead them and then let it lead them. And just keeps it keeps leading you down these roads because the Spirit will start to show you little key words. And when you do a study on those key words and see who that's referring to, it just keeps opening that can of worms more and more. And you learn more and more and it blows your mind at all the things that were right there in front of you and we never caught. And this is God's doing. He's opening our eyes. So, I love you guys. Bless you all in Jesus' name. I hope this video helps you understand and inspires you to go do your own research on this because I think your eyes will be open just like mine were that we're out of here before the tribulation starts. We're going to be out of here long before it begins. I believe quite a, quite a bit of time before it begins. But, that event was going to trigger the subsequent events to the seven-year tribulation. See you guys in the next video.